It's time to talk sports. It's Hacksaw's Headlines. A panorama of the world of sports. Stories, comments, and opinions. Touchdown, Now, here's iconic sports talk show host Lee Hacksaw Hamilton and co-host John Riley. Who wants to talk sports on a Monday? We do. From the Dixie Line Lumber and Home Center Studios in San Diego, we welcome you to Hacksaw's Headlines. This is our Monday bonus podcast. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lee Hacksaw Hamilton, along with my co-host, John Riley. We are ready to talk sports with you, and we're going to go a lot of different directions on a very busy Monday bonus podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Dixie Line Lumber and Home Centers, 9 stores in San Diego to serve you. You got projects in the home, in the office, out on the patio. Think Dixie Line Lumber. And by North County Eye Centers, Poway and Escondido, I don't care where you live in San Diego County, they are offering you free eye exams right now and a discount on your frames, on your glasses. Give them a call. We use them. We were pleased. You're going to need help with your eyes. Think North County Eye Center, Poway and Escondido. John Riley, good afternoon. Coming off a great sports weekend. Glad to see you standing after your busy weekend. Mm -hmm. I was so fatigued. There was so much to cover and do on Sunday. I almost passed out. But recharge the batteries. Monday bonus podcast about to begin. Yeah, here we are. You know, I, I went to the Del Mar races over the weekend, had a great time with the family. But let's dig in. I mean, we've got a lot of great stuff here, including the British Open. Full disclosure, I saw that bad hat you were wearing. That was an <laughs> ugly hat. A couple of pieces of business. X marks the spot. We think we have solved our problems with X and Twitter. We are broadcasting now uh, not only on YouTube channel, but back on Twitter as well as Facebook. So hope you'll stay with us for that. X marks the spot. You're on social media. Look at you. I know you're on social media. I want you to join my social media team. I want you to follow me on X, a.k.a. Twitter. Just go to Hacksaw1090. Hacksaw1090. Hit follow. Another item, if you like sports, Have you checked my website? Do you check my website every morning? Why are you not checking my website? It's all written. It's an absolute ton of information every day. And when you go to the website, there's a big orange box. I want you to join a Hacksaw's Insiders group. We're going to figure out a way to get together and stage a Hacksaw Insiders group party. We want you to do that. I want you to subscribe. I want you to share. That way you'll get the alerts every time we put something up on the YouTube channel. And we do that an awful lot. And John created this when we started. It's totally out of control. It's like <laughs> an oil spill. It's called Fans Forum, John. Yeah, Fans Forum, an oil <laughs> spill. That's exactly what it is. So, yeah, if you want to, you know, get be part of, uh, well, Fans Forum, you got a question or comment for Lee, just type in your uh, comment or question in the live chat on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, and we'll get you involved in Fans Forum. Okay, let's get started. Topics on the table. We're going to go a lot of different directions. I'm going to challenge you to get into Fans Forum with each of these different topics. I spent the entire day watching the weather in Troon, Scotland. Mm -hmm. and watching Xander Shoffley and what he did to win the British Open. What a spectacular group of hours it was to see what he accomplished Mm -hmm. and, John, to see what happened to everybody else that was chasing him. I tried to come up with a word to describe what we saw, and I I just couldn't come up with the right adjective adverb to describe it. So you're the smart guy in the room. Give me a word to describe what that kid— not a kid anymore, what that San Diegan, what that Aztec accomplished at the Open. I was getting Tiger Wood vibes. I mean, because, you know, he went in two, uh, two of these majors this year. He's finally arisen because he's been on the on the edge of being one of the top golfers in the PGA. What a run for, for Aztec for life, Xander Shoffley. Uh, I'm going to use the word because I think it's arrived. I think he's a superstar. No, no doubt. I mean, he had won tournaments prior. He had been on the periphery of accomplishing something in the most important tournaments, hadn't gotten there till he got here with the PGA Championships. And then what he did uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday was just spectacular. He's got ice water in his veins. You know, there were eight golfers separated by two shots at the turn in the final round yesterday. Eight. <laughs> and they were all chasing him. And he ripped off birdies birdied 11, birdied 13, 14, 16. 
stayed out of bunkers. He stayed out of the high grass. He got lucky bounces along the way. He did not self-destruct Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the weather. I love that type of weather. I love Scotland's weather. That weather was miserable for the golfers. Dude shot a 65 on the final day. He finishes at a minus nine, and he did that with everybody chasing him. There was a confidence. There was a calmness. There was a maturity to fight off every one of those guys that made runs at him. And maybe he didn't pay attention to the leaderboard. Maybe he wasn't looking over his shoulder. He did say in the post tournament golf con- uh, conversations with the, uh, the global media what he learned at the PGA championships about the pressure of trying to win a grand slam helped him a great deal there was there was just a calm about him in his game especially on the final nine holes when he reeled off all those birdies and then prior to that there was just a focus despite everything that was happening with the weather. And the weather just got worse and worse Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I mean, this guy came together. I and mean, I don't think this is a once-in-a-lifetime weekend. I think if he can continue to play with that level of focus, that level of intensity, and the ability to make every conceivable shot possible, like I said, my word of the day on Sesame Street, a superstar. Yeah, he's definitely arrived. The first half before the turn on Sunday, he missed a couple of birdie putts just by millimeters. <laughs> so that that lead that he had could have been even greater. But I just love seeing the local boy doing good here, San Diego, Scripps Ranch, Aztec for life. But I, the other part about this tournament that I enjoyed is, is all the different holes, the railroad track hole, the postage stamp hole, all the weather issues. It just made it like a, like a fun obstacle course. Oh, it was. And as we marched through, and I watched a lot of this British Open. I probably watched more British Open this weekend than I have in the last group of years. But all I could think about was what you and I talked about Thursday as the first round was beginning. The pothole bunkers, six to eight feet deep. Oh, Holy brutal. cow. <laughs> uh, the railway hole, uh, the coffin hole, the 623-yard mile hole, the rain, the wind, the slog, the slate gray sky. I mean, it was so hard. Let's just talk briefly about the other group of golfers and what happened to each of them. Okay, let's bring it up. Here if, you go. If it wasn't Xander... I was rooting for Justin Rose because he's just been a pure pro for more than a decade and a half on the tour. And he had won the Open way back as a young golfer. He had only three bogeys in his first 54 holes. And think about he was fighting the elements like everybody else with three bogeys in 54 holes. Now, in the middle of Sunday's round, he hit about a six-hole stretch where his game kind of got away from him. Some of the shots weren't good. He missed a few putts, and that kind of knocked him down the board and eventually kind of sealed his fate that he wasn't going to be able to win the tournament. He did rally back and wind up in second place. Billy Horschel, best major of his life. He had the lead. He got erratic off the tee on the front nine, and then somehow he dialed it back in He reeled off three straight birds, 16, 17, and 18, climbed back into second place. Billy Horschel, Justin Rose tied for second. Shane Lowry, fan's favorite from across the border in Ireland. Um, He lost his composure. I started to read really bad body language. He just struggled. And what killed him, most of this happened on Saturday where he kind of fell back of the pack. He couldn't survive a bogey, double bogey on back-to-back holes. And all of a sudden, he was spraying shots everywhere. He struggled. Scotty Scheffler has just never solved how to play Lynx golf, and that's a big issue. His body language was really bad. His putter went away. He could just read the frustration level of, of Scotty off the tee, hitting the fairway or hitting out of the fairway, having to hit it back, his struggles on the green. So he obviously wasn't wasn't himself, and he's never quite figured out. He, he struggles over in Scottsdale on mm. the Lynx course there. He just had never figured it out, and then you throw in all the, the weather and the elements. It just beat him up. Bryson DeChambeau, I expected much more. What a fatal start. Bogeyed four of the first six holes on Thursday. Never a candidate in the tournament. Wound up nine over par. The shocker to me was Rory McIlroy, and he's in a mental funk right now with his game. 
uh, I don't call it a Grand Slam curse. It's been 10 years since he's won a major. But he went double bogey, posted his stamp hole, another double bogey on the railway hole. He just was never in it. Minus, there was nothing on the scorecard that said he was going to get it back together. He wound up going 12 over par, missed the cut completely, and left. And his game is not where his game many thought would be. And this is a guy that I think was emotionally damaged after what happened in the U.S. Open. And boy, he played poorly. And there was Tiger Woods, sad sight. 79 and 77 the first two days. Six bogeys, two double bogeys the first round. Came back with more bogeys the second round. Off the tee, didn't hit it for yardage. Hit it off the fairway, was in all kinds of trouble. He had bad putter problems. It was really a pity party just to to watch Tiger Woods. And maybe the worst display is what I saw the first day. John Daly. Remember him once upon a time was a hot guy, and now he's now he's grossly overweight, and he's got this big beard, and he he smokes and he drinks. Shot an shot an eighty two on the first day, and started the second round and quit. You know, I, I understand he won, and and he he he's eligible for t- up till age sixty because he's won a major. What an embarrassment to golf. <laughs> just not the way he dresses. He dresses like a billboard and a jerk, but just the way he conducts himself. He, and I've interviewed him a couple of times. And I just kind of got turned off by the whole persona. You know, he's got his sticks, he's got his smokes, and he likes his suds. Why the <laughs> hell he's on the uh, still on the PGA Tour? Unfortunately, he's got the exemption because it won Grand Slams in the gifted year or two he had on the course. His whole life is just unraveled. So, I mean, to see him on the course was just... And utter embarrassment. So, hats off to Xander. Superstar, I think, has arrived. And the other guys, they all made runs at him, and Xander held them off, and then they all self-destructed. And I just, I sat there, and I just watched the elements. The elements were brutal. I mean, the wind is blowing sideways, and the rain is blowing sideways. And guys are on the greens putting, and the, you, you could see the ball because of the wind. And guys are <laughs> off the tee. 18 to 20 mile an hour winds in their face. They hit it high and it stalls and comes down. And I think I told you the first round, guys played the front nine along the the, uh, Bay of, I think it's a Bay of Funday. It's the Irish Sea. They played the front nine with the wind in their face. So they get ready to go to the 10th tee to go back the other way, inland. And the weather had changed. The wind was in their face going back. These guys were so psyched out. They just mentally, these poor guys fell apart. And it was just, you know, I'm a big believer in body language. You know, but I think you have to seal yourself from it and say, okay, I just, I had a shot that went awry because of the weather and the elements and not lose your mind over it because everybody else in your group and everybody group behind you is going to play in the same elements. Some of these guys just didn't cope with it. So superstar from San Diego has arrived, and John Riley says... Yeah, he's arrived. And and you could see that, like, on the on Sunday, dude was focused. Meanwhile, Justin Rose, you know, local, he was British. He was really emotional, you yeah. know, as he was trying to get this thing together, and he missed a few putts and kind of got angry. And the fans were with him with the emotion, but Xander was like robo-golfer, yeah. you know, just grinding through everybody. But I want to go back to the British Open. I- isn't there like a, a collection of, of courses that they tend to rotate? Yes, they all do. So, so how often do we get to see it at Troon? Maybe once every eight to ten years. I mean, there's so many different courses. I think they go to Northern Ireland next year. You know, and the historic prestigious one is St. Andrews in, in northeast Scotland. And But they, they all rotate, Carnoustie and a whole bunch of others. So it's just special. I mean, this thing's been played since the 1850s. I th- this was the 152nd Open. Wow. Pretty cool. And 158 guys teed off. And you know how many broke par by the time they got to the finish line Sunday night in the rain and the wind and the cold? Mm. Nine. Nine guys broke Nine. court out of 158 who teed off. Oh, that's a brutal course. It's tough. Well, it's the British <laughs> Open. Yeah. Um, reaction to Tiger? You, you always talk about the pity party and, and Tiger hanging around. Tiger's like like uh, John Daly in, in that respect where they're former majors winners and they get out there and, you know, they, they've got the legacy. But, you know, 
when when Tiger was bending over to pull ball out of the hole, he looked like an old man with a bad back. I mean, mm-hmm. you could tell he's just a shell of himself, and it's disappointing. But I'll tell you what, when I saw Xander, especially walking up to the 18th hole with his caddy, his former San Diego State uh, golf teammate, his partner, Man, that was just so dynamic. It was like another Tiger Woods. We got a new young kid that is coming here and taking the PGA. Hey, you're a golf fan. We have not taken a lot of fans' forum comments on pro golf. Did you watch the British Open? Do we have a new superstar? Is this the next great one from the States? Feel free to jump on board if you're into golf. From golf... Let's talk baseball, John. Baseball, Padres, Dodgers, Angels. What do you got, Lee? We got all kinds of headlines here. What a weekend for Padre pitching. How about the Padre starters in the Cleveland series? That was the first place Cleveland Guardians, a.k.a. my Cleveland Indians. First place. And the Padre starters, Waldron, Cease, King, 20 innings, gave up two runs. Beautiful. To a first place team. Mm. And Dylan Cease has obviously made some structural changes in his delivery. Second straight, unbelievable performance. This time he throws a one hitter, strikes out 10. Michael King came back on Sunday, six no hit innings. Waldrum gave him six quality innings of one run ball before the bullpen imploded on Friday night. Starters were really impressive. Now, day off today, they go to Washington. Randy Vasquez, who has a tendency to get beat up, he's going to have to start. They're still short on starting pitching. They got another problem. They sent Johnny Brito to AAA El Paso to get him ready to come back, to be extended, put into the rotation, shut down. He's got forearm problems in El Paso. And Adam Mazur, whom they sent down, he showed up damaged. He's gotten lit in his El Paso starts. He had a 7.74 ERA here, should not have been in the major leagues, but valiantly tried to hang in there. It's back to El Paso. He's got an ERA down there now, 7.29. Brutal. So, there, you know, we're, we're marching towards the trade deadline. That becomes a big issue. So the Padres win two of three in Cleveland. Off day today, Washington. Then they go play, play the first place Baltimore Orioles, who are really, really good. So that's, that's the Padre notebook. Dodgers, they've been waiting they have arrived. They have just activated Tyler Glass now, Clayton Kershaw. Both will start against the San Francisco Giants this right. week. Four-game series, L.A. San Francisco. They're going to put Kershaw on a pitch count, but he had four minor league rehab starts. He pitched pretty decently. Glass now, who's got there's an innings issue with him because he's never thrown 180 innings, and he's on on this track towards that. Glass now seems to be completely healthy, coming off what appeared to be a minor hip issue. Uh, new trade talks. The Dodgers are talking to Detroit about the ace of their staff. I can't believe the Tigers are going to trade a 13-game winner. But they can only control Tariq Skubal for one more year, and they put him on the trade block. So he's available. Nathan Ovaldi is available. Cal Quantrill is available. Jesus Lozardo, Miami, is available. I got to believe the Dodgers are going to get into this bidding war, and I think they're going to get one of these pitchers. They were trying over the weekend to try to move to the front of the line in this Tiger trade for Scabal. And the question is, what are they going to trade? Uh, What we hear is Outman, Lux, possibly the young infielder, outfielder Miguel Vargas, or the kid catcher at double-A who's had a good bounce-back season, Cartaya. But the Dodger, the help from the Dodgers pitching staff has started to arrive, and they just sent today, Bruce Dar Greaterall has been sent out on rehab, as well as one of the other pitchers on the DL. Again, the Dodgers at one point had 16 on the disabled list. Now they got four of them that look like they're about ready to possibly come back. So we'll keep an eye on that. We've not had a lot of good news to talk about the Angels. There's a piece of good news. It's going to bear watching. Mike Trout left Anaheim. is in Salt Lake City tonight to begin rehab. Hey, He's been running. This is after this extended knee meniscus scope surgery. Running, taking dry swings, then in a cage at Angel Stadium. He's going to play at least three games, if not four, in Salt Lake City. He could be back when the Halos in the lineup on on Thursday, keep an eye on that. And I don't know why they did this. Every time the Angels have an opportunity to get a get a player that might upgrade, they always go shopping at the Dollar General store. They just signed Johnny Cueto. 
to a free agent contract. <laughs> Cueto had been in the Texas farm system on extended rehab, never got called up, so he opted out. And, you know, once upon a time, that was a hell of a starting pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds and the San Francisco Giants. Career record 114 and 101, but he's just not the same guy. Instead of trying to do something in terms of a trade to, to get another quality arm, they go to Dollar General Store and sign Johnny Cueto. He's at Salt Lake City, too. So those are the news and notes about the local teams. You want to talk about the Padres, Dodger Blue, Halos? Go ahead. That Padre, uh, you know, two out of three in Cleveland. I mean, that's an accomplishment. That's a, They're the best record in MLB, don't they? Yeah, but the division's pretty weak, and they've been doing it. They've been doing it with great pitching, and they do have a lot of young arms. And they win in two, one, one, nothing, three, one games. Did not happen. Obviously, this week the Padres starters shut them down. Yeah, I mean, I love this King. I mean, he's turning out to be better than I expected. Bulldog. Yeah, in the trade with the Yankees and Cueto. Remember, you were down on Cueto a few weeks ago, but boy, has he turned it around. I told you, don't worry about him. He's going to get it right. They changed his mechanics. Are you talking about Cease, not Johnny Cueto? Pardon me, Cease, Cease. May another culpa, may a culpa, yeah, may a maximum it's, culpa. It's another. Five-letter word that starts with a C. But Dylan Cease, I mean, I'm telling you, he looks so sharp. I dialed mean, in. Dialed in. And then Waldron, fantastic. But Musgrove is not going to be for like another week. Darvish, nobody knows. I mean, there's still a lot of question marks. And then people are talking about maybe we should trade Hassan Kim. But who's going to want to trade for him to get two months worth of a guy that's hitting, you know, like around 230? Unless you're going to trade to sign him. Anything's possible. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, granted, he's not had the statistical season this year that the All Star season he had a year ago, uh, but I still think he's really a gifted player. But to get something in the trade market, you're going to have to turn around and you're going to have to give something. And if it's not going to be a, a hot prospect in the farm system, then it's got to be a proven major leaguer. So who knows? It's, I'm not saying they have to trade Kim or Campusano, the other name that I'd mentioned, but. To, to get, you're going to have to give up something of quality to get the right pitcher. Yeah. Well, they will have to give up some quality to get what they need, but they don't have a lot of assets to deal with. But I, I'm also in, intrigued by Xander Bogarts coming back. He's yep. been hitting pretty well. And so imagine if Tatis and Bogarts become the, the, the old Tatis and Bogarts and they come back. But, but Tatis is still like late August, right? Yeah. I mean, he's not even running. He They, they did a second MRI. And the inflammation and the fluid buildup has dissipated. It's gone away. However, there are still signs of the stress fracture reaction in the bone area, which means he can't do any heavy-duty baseball stuff until there's a healing in that bone area. So the inflammation and the fluid or the blood's gone, which means now the healing can occur. But you're not going to have him do heavy-duty running and all that because then he, he could— have the stress reaction return or we actually fracture the thigh. Mm. So I I think we're talking end of August before and we we have I have no confidence right now about Musgrove because all he's done is just throw fastballs in the bullpen and that's not the same as ramping up the pitch max effort on a start on a Thursday. So I think we're a ways away from that and nobody's talking about the significance of Darvish. So AJ AJ's got to find he's going to have to find some pitching along the way. And Johnny Cueto to Anaheim. You kidding me? <laughs> you know, I, I agree with you. When he was with the Reds, he was terrific. Yeah. And he was good, but not great with the Giants. But the when I think of Johnny Cueto, I always think of Mark Grant. Because Mark Grant would always talk about how Cueto was innovative. And he'd be like Louis Tiant sometimes. You know, the and do the flamingo stance and all these different things. And Mark Grant was always saying, oh, if I had to do it all over again, I would have tried some of that, you know, shtick, some of this uniqueness to try to create some deception. Um, but, you know, Cueto's hanging around. When he's right, he's good. Well, he hadn't been right in a long time because he did have arm problems. But like I said, 114 wins, 101 losses. I mean. He was dynamic. He was just, he was you Darvish before you Darvish in oh, terms yeah. of release points. And is it coming over the top? Is it coming from the side? Is it a sidestep? I mean, he was, he was really different. One other baseball note here. Got some late breaking stories this morning. Yeah, here we go. Braves, Red Sox, and Rangers. If Atlanta's not had enough injuries that would sink them, now they got this. Ozzie Albies fractured his wrist, second baseman last night. Gone at least eight weeks, probably uh, into the end of September, early October. And he's kind of a catalyst. He's kind of a a glue-type guy. 
And they've had so many injuries there with Acuna, with Michael Hill losing the ace strider. The catcher, Sean Murphy, was hurt. Olsen was hurt. Then they're still in first place. But, I mean, it's that's that's a tough blow there. Red Sox don't like to see this. They've had a really good middle third of the season. Had a very young team. Started really badly. Have played much, much better baseball in the last couple of months. They lose Kenley Jansen again. Irregular heartbeat surfaces again. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's had this problem dating back to when he was the Dodgers. He had to go to the hospital to have a jolt to get his heartbeat regulated again. And it's got to do with blood pressure and it, it may have some other issues there. But so he's in a little bit of shutdown mode right now. Uh, and in Texas, it looks like they're going to be in fire sale mode with pitching pretty quickly. Max Scherzer's been shut down again. He's got discomfort in his forearm and he's got shoulder fatigue. And he's had just a, he's been on the DL twice this year with different assorted arm injuries. So that's that's not good there. So that's the, the latest breaking news in baseball. You know, when I think of all Ozzy Albies, I remember going to Petco, Padres, Braves, Albies, this little itty bitty second baseman was batting cleanup. And I'm like, what are they thinking? That's, he should be a, like a one or a two hitter. And sure enough, he hit a, a bomb at Petco. That guy's got power. I mean, he's a legit player. So that's a big loss for the Braves. But you said that, you know, Scherzer is, you know, setbacks. But imagine the Dodgers. They get Glass now. They get Kershaw back. Those guys could have setbacks again. The Dodgers could be in some trouble as well. True. I mean, but, but the Dodgers are still in first place. They had 16 pitchers on the DL, and they're still in first place. <laughs> now they got two back. They're going to monitor them. They may get two more back. They just activated Joe Kelly yesterday. So that's five guys off the DL. That's the Calvary Looks like it's about to arrive. So if you're a baseball fan, feel free. Jump on board. Fans form. Want to hear what you've got to say. We go from that to the NFL. The NFL. Here we go. Here's the big board. A lot of topics on the table. We've been following this whole diatribe with the 49ers. Brandon Ayuk meets with general manager John Lynch. Gets a course in economics 101. Why they don't want to do a contract extension right now. A week ago, he said, that's fine with me. We'll play this entire season. A week later, when we got to the weekend, he was on social media. I have demanded to be traded. I don't want to be here, etc. New England has surfaced and the Patriots are willing to make an offer to get Brandon Ayuk. They're willing to trade a number one pick. Knowing how bad the Patriots are, that number one pick's going to be pretty high. I don't think Frisco wants to trade the wide receiver, but I think if they could get a high number one, they'd trade him and keep Debo Samuels, who's already signed to a a contract extension. The two very, very different receivers. Speaking of the Patriots, man, they are peeved. (laughs) They're opening training camp, and they've named uh, Jacoby Brissett the journeyman as the starting quarterback rather than the North Carolina rookie Drake May, Mm -hmm. who is, what, the third pick in the draft? Boston media just banging on them. And they're saying, we want somebody to run this offense with this new coaching staff and we'll develop this quarterback. And then today, columnist wrote, this might be the worst modern offense in NFL history. They have no game breakers in Boston with the Patriots. So Patriots are having a really tough time. Let's talk about the Bears and the number one draft pick and the quarterback. Uh, Let's first of all start about the entrepreneur that is Caleb Williams. So Caleb Williams has different lawyers representing him in different talks with the Chicago Bears. They've all been approved by the Players Association. But every time you want to discuss a certain aspect of the contract, evidently you're dealing with a different lawyer. So Caleb Williams goes to the Bears and he has one lawyer tell the Bears, we want this four or five year contract, which is normal. This is the money, which is all slotted. You know what you're going to get. And the first lawyer says, we want a clause in the contract that you cannot franchise tag him any time during this year, Mm. during the four years or the fifth year. You can't franchise tag him. You can't keep him from going to free agency. So the Bears, Bears are taken back by that. Second lawyer shows up and is indicated, wants a full no trade clause. Another lawyer shows up. I'm going to, uh, with his approval, form a LLC corporation Mm. based out of Delaware. We're going to take all the money you're going to pay him, and it's going to go into the LLC, which means it's tax-free. Another lawyer shows up and says, we're coming up with another plan. 
we want you to pay him the amount of money. It's four years, 39 mil. But we want that devised as a loan so there's no tax. So <laughs> Caleb Williams, the entrepreneur, comes up with all these demands through these different lawyers to the Bears. The Bears go to the National Football League, and the National Football League refuses to approve the contract. They said, all this stuff is in violation of the collective bargaining agreement. We're not changing the CBA for Caleb Williams. So yeah. they took everything and put it in a brown envelope and gave it back to the lawyers and said, no, the contract is the contract, and this is how the NFL wants us to negotiate this contract. He eventually signed four years, $39 million. He didn't get the franchise tag clause. He's got to be paid like you, me, and everybody else on the Chicago Bears, mm -hmm. not as a loan, not tax-free. So anyhow, the entrepreneur in Caleb Williams got off to a rocky start. Now the quarterback that is Caleb Williams, everybody is really excited to see what he's going to be all about. Uh, third item, Jacksonville Jaguars. See that logo there? This is really intriguing. You remember the vice president of finance that stole all this money from the Jaguars in the offseason? Oh, yeah, yeah. Got caught. He stole $22 million by rigging accounts and hiding money that was coming in that didn't. nobody knew was never recorded and went to him. This guy's in prison, by the way, already. I think his name is Amin Petit. Anyhow, Jacksonville just filed Friday night $66 million lawsuit against Petit. They're foreclosing on everything he owns, all his Mercedes-Benz, three palatial estates, etc. This guy was living high on the hog, and this guy was a gambling addict. They are, what, what is it, garnishing yeah, yeah. everything he owns. Well, yeah, he stole from them. Then they also filed paperwork with NFL business partner FanDuel. Mm. They're demanding FanDuel give back all $22 million <laughs> that this vice president gambled and lost. A oh, fat chance of that. Said that was ill-gotten money mm -hmm. that you got from a guy who stole it from us. And we don't care that you're a partner with the NFL. That's our money illegally gotten by you. We want that money back. NFL has not said anything about this yet. That's kind of different. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, final topic, Green Bay Packers. Everybody's opening camp. Guess who's not going to be there? Quarterback, Jordan Love. Really? Jordan Love is in the final year of his contract. Now, going, you know, this is the Utah State quarterback that has grown into the job, earned the job. Aaron Rodgers left, had a really mystical season, uh, 30, 32 touchdowns last year, 3,000-plus yards. He's only, he's only started one year. He's hardly ever played, aside from last year's really good season. And he's slated to make 10.5 mil in the final year. They're trying to negotiate the extension. He can't be a free agent yet. He's not qualified. He wants 45 to 50 million right now. Okay, yeah, right. He gets him 10.5 mm -hmm. to 45 to 50 million right now after one season of success in the league. And <laughs> they announced this morning he's not coming to camp. Now, ah. He's going to get fined $50,000 a day because that's the CBA, but. Again, everybody at the quarterback position in the NFL, whether you're a longtime veteran or a one-year starter, everybody wants $50 million. It's just that Green Bay's got, a, they got an issue now with that guy who obviously has to be there for them to be successful. So, John, those are hot topics on the table. Go ahead. Talk about Caleb Williams. You know, you went to law school. You didn't cut class that day. Uh, but uh, talk about Caleb Williams, Jordan Love, et cetera. Well, Caleb Williams, I mean, I, I love the innov innovative ideas. Oh, you're a capitalist. But, yeah. God. But it's like Shohei Otani has kind of destroyed this whole contract thing about all these innovative ways to move money around. Now, by the way, if he set up an LLC, it's still not tax free. It's just structured to minimize taxes. Right. It's not zero taxes. Uh, but, you know, he, it is a collective bargaining agreement. There's not much he can can do there. Uh, the Ayuk situation in San Francisco, you know, if he doesn't want to be there, the Niners should trade him. And and uh, and if you can get a number one and, and, you know, something else for him, I would do that in a heartbeat if I were, uh, you know, the, the Niners. Well, the only thing is Debo keeps getting hurt. So if you're choosing Debo Samuel, multi-position guy, who's already signed, but you can't keep him on the field because he's he can't handle 17 games. And you got Ayuk, who's had this unbelievable breakout season last year. 
I thought Samuel would have been traded by this point, which would then allow him to take Debo's money and give it to Ayuk. But Ayuk has just become a, a diva. He's just he's like the wind that keeps changing. He says one thing on Monday and it feels different by Friday. And Frisco's got an issue now. And then you remember they we talked about this last week. They do have to re-sign Brock Purdy, and that's going to be a pros pro quarterback contract. Hey, I saw a video on Instagram of Jerry Rice's son catching balls. Brendan. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, is, that, is he legit? Is he like a real deal? Or? He's in the Chargers camp. He's going to have to prove he can do oh, it. Oh, he's a Charger. Yes. Yeah, uh, he was a late pick. Okay. No, Jerry Rice was furious that his kid was on the board to fifth round, sixth round, etc. But he's in a right situation. They need wide receivers. So he's going to get his chance in his preseason games to see how he does. Right on. So that's where we are as it relates to pro football. A couple of college football notes. This is this is tough. Yeah, Fresno State, Utah State. There's so many coaches that are moving around here. Yeah, all the veteran coaches in the Mountain West Conference are gone. It started with Brady Hope walking away before the end of last season, announcing his, quote, retirement. Wyoming's coach, who'd done a great job without a lot of resources, he left Laramie to retire. Jeff Tedford from Fresno State has just retired. Uh, he's got heart disease, and I don't know whether he needs a heart transplant or whether it, it's got to do with a heart valve, but he has stepped away. He was 44 and 22. He was a quarterback guru. I mean, that's why Fresno State's been so good so recently, and they don't have a lot of resources. He has just retired. And Blake Anderson at Utah State did a great job flipping that program. He just got forced out. And finally, the details came out yesterday. Blake Anderson had a defensive tackle that was involved in a domestic abuse case, a semi-sexual abuse case with a woman. And Blake Anderson interceded. He threw the kid off the program and told the kid, go to the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be in this locker room. But he interviewed the kid. He conducted his own private interview with the victim. He did not tell the university that he had interceded in this case. He didn't cooperate with Utah State. And in essence, it's a Title IX violation. Mm. And then the university started their own probe, and they found out all this data about their head coach who was running interference. It wasn't that he was trying to create the fact that this didn't happen because he, he'd blown the player out already, but he wasn't honest with the university, which was conducting a Title IX investigation, and and he wasn't apologetic or anything. He was just really standoffish. That I had to find out what was fact versus fiction. It's my player. I had to know. Well, that's not the way the university structure works on something serious like domestic abuse or Title IX. He got he got tossed, and they said we're terminating your contract with cause with with cause, and you don't get the four point five million buyout either. So there's going to be a lawsuit coming there. So you look at the Mountain West Conference outside of the coach at Air Force Academy, Troy Calhoun, and maybe maybe the guy at Colorado State, Jay Norville. Hell of a lot of coaches gone who are really good coaches. Yeah, and a lot of quarterbacks are gone, too. (laughs) Um, So, you know, I remember when Tedford was rumored to be one of the candidates here at San Diego State, like about, I don't know, 20 years ago or something. But he was at Cal Berkeley, I think, before that. He'd been around the Pac-12. Just a bright guy, good guy, old school guy, quarterback guru guy. I mean, if you just open up, you know, new YouTube or Google, how many really quality quarterbacks come out of Fresno State? His fingerprints are on a whole bunch of those guys. And mm-hmm. He's a really good man and unfortunately, you know, forced into retirement because of health. Hey, Fans Forum is open. You got questions. We're going to allow you to pop those questions or allow you to make a statement. Feel free to jump into Fans Forum. Pick any of the topics that we've talked about. We get to halftime. This podcast is brought to you by North County Eye Center of Poway and Escondido. I don't care where you live in San Diego. When it's time for you to get help for your eyes, these people right now are offering a free eye exam through the month of July and a discount on frames for your new glasses. I want you to call them and make an appointment and just come see them. They're in Poway. They're in Escondido. These are special people. They took care of me. They did a great job. I invite you to sample what they have to offer. 11 different eye specialists there on their roster. North County Eye Center, Poway in Escondido. Give them a call and tell them Hacksaw sent me in. And our podcast is also brought to you by Dixie Line Lumber and Home Centers. There are nine stores in San Diego to serve you. You know how bloody hot it's been. It was 100 degrees in my driveway today. 
Last week when I came here to do the podcast, it was 111. Now, we work and live in inland North County, San Diego. I'm sorry we don't live on the coast. I wish we lived on the coast, but we don't. But because I got new windows and I got doors for my house about five years ago at Dixie Line, I don't use my air conditioning. This sounds stupid. I don't use my air conditioning until about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. So I'm able, because my house has been able to stay cool, because in essence, it's sealed off. And that's because of Dixie Line Lumber. Same thing you've done here in your castle is use Dixie Line for doors and windows. Yeah. I mean, we we got a new front door from Dixie Line, but we run our air conditioning a lot. So I think we need to replace our windows. And I think that would make a big difference. And these are the people. If you got projects, they've got the materials and they got the ideas to Dixie Line Lumber. We go to the second half. Couple of business items. X marks the spot. You're on X, a.k.a. Twitter. You're on social media. I want you to follow me because we put a lot of stuff up on my, a.k.a. Twitter account. Just go to at Hacksaw 1090, at Hacksaw 1090, hit the follow button, then you can get involved with me. Second item, you like sports? I don't know what the hell you're doing tomorrow morning, but you should be on my website when you get up tomorrow morning. I write a volume of information every day. It's LeeHacksawHamilton.com. It's all written Give me five minutes. I'll tell you everything there is going on in the world of sports. And while you're there, on the homepage, there's a big orange box. Fill it out. Join Hacksaw's Insiders Group. You'll get emails about a whole bunch of different things that we are doing. And we started this when we started this thing. What, 169 shows we've done together? Yeah, something like that. We're still talking to each other. (laughs) Um, He came up with the idea. It's called Fans Forum. Mm -hmm. When we're done with this podcast You're staying here with us because it's your turn on your show. It's called Fans Forum, John. Yeah, look at all these guys piling in here. We've got (laughs) Callan and Chris and Jason and Matt and Schickster and a bunch of other guys in here. Was that Sam Crow and Derek? So we're going to get you all involved in Fans Forum. You got a question or comment for Lee? Drop it in the live chat on Facebook X or YouTube. And by the way, want you to share. Tell everybody what we're doing. We're here Mondays at 1 p.m. Pacific. We're here Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific. Tell all the people that follow you that Hacksaw is back. Today might be a record. We may be over 400 on the live stream by the time we finish at the top of the hour. Now, we we think we've solved, (laughs) knock on wood, fingers crossed, we think we've solved some of the problems we had with X and our audio files. But, you know, between what we're doing on our live stream, on YouTube, with Twitter, and with Facebook, this thing is cooking right now. And also, we're also asking everybody just to follow us. We're trying to get to 10,000 followers, and we're marching towards that direction. So tell your friends at Hacksaw. 1090. John, you ready for the second half? Because we got other things you need to talk about. Yeah, Hacksaw is back, baby. All right, here we go. <laughs> Not everybody <laughs> speaks with that vibrance. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little NBA here. Some uh, notes around the league. Yeah, Steve Ballmer, the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers, uh, said he tried really hard to retain Paul George, the high scoring guard. The team offered him three years, $150 million. They offered him the exact same thing that they offered Kawhi Leonard that Leonard signed immediately. And Leonard took less money to hold the team together. Paul George said, this is great. Let's keep this franchise together. They offered him the exact same thing, and he turned it down. He refused to respond. Then at the end of the season, they said, we're going to open these negotiations. You're a free agent. We want to keep you here, keep the core together. They offered him the same amount of money. He turned it down again. Then he came back with a four-year offer. Then he came back with a demand for a full no-trade clause. Then he came back, he wanted a whole thing guaranteed. And Steve Ballmer just flat out told him, we need to keep this franchise together. We can't make exceptions to the rule. This is what Kawhi got. Everybody else is going to get that or a little bit less than that so we can have enough to put a whole team together, and it's gone. He said the goal was... This is the NBA rules as it relates to the salary cap. Work with us. Paul George said no. Paul George left, never said goodbye. That's kind of nasty. L.A. Lakers summer league season is over. Bronny James had back-to-back games of 12 and 14 points. He sat out the last game of the season. 
Lakers think he made enough progress to come to camp to be on their 50 man, 15-man roster. Dalton Connect, who had a very rocky start, the big 6'5 shooting forward, three-point guy from Tennessee, he finished up beat. He had four good games in a row. Johnny averaged 22 points a game uh, in the summer league, wow. and he shot 41%. From the three-point arc, that was after a crummy start. His first two games were terrible. And the last four games he played, he played pretty well. Lakers lost another player today. Spencer Dinwiddie, veteran guard, first guard off the bench, left. He went to the Dallas Mavericks. So Lakers Lakers have got still 15 guys under contracts, but they lost one of the veterans uh, that they had interest there. Uh, Denver, we, we thought this was going to happen. It finally happened. They got the point guard to replace Cantavius Caldwell-Pope, who jumped to New Orleans as a free agent. They waited, 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 and the Clippers made the Russell Westbrook trade. Because of the salary cap issues, Clippers traded Westbrook to Utah. Second round draft pick went the other way. Utah bought him out, released him, signed immediately with Denver. Denver sent a second round pick to Utah. So in essence, it was a Clipper Denver Nuggets trade, and the fact is now, R.W. Westbrook, he's going to be a starting guard to replace KCP, mm. Antivius Caldwell Pope. Last topic, Orlando. This is a really sad story. This was a this is one of the really nice gentlemen I ever met, and I interviewed him a couple times. His name is Pat Williams. He was the president. He was the founder of the Orlando Magic team. Became their first general manager in addition, and it was a little bit of a different era, but. Pat Williams drafted Shaquille O'Neal. Pat Williams drafted Penny Hardaway. Pat Williams drafted Dwight Howard. All within the first seven years of the Orlando Magic. And they were a really good franchise. And then unfortunately the CBA changed. Players left because of mega contracts. That was the beginning of the two and three superstar guys per team. They went to the major markets. Orlando was never ever the same. Uh, he was really upset that the NBA changed the rules and kind of stripped his franchise of all of its quality players. But he was a smart guy. He was a religious guy. He had seven adopted children. He was just a special human being. Pat Williams just passed away at the end of this past week. I think he was 84 or 86. He was he was really kind of a cool, cool guy and obviously a magnificent player personnel evaluator because he brought all those stars in to Orlando right from the start. So, John, no air balls. Hit a three-point shot. <laughs> make, make a public statement about the Clippers, what's happened in Denver, and if you want, about Orlando. Well, yeah, Westbrook keeps landing on his feet. I yeah. mean, that guy, you know, he was like a dog for a while. You know, uh, both the good side of a dog and the bad side of a dog. But, you know, the Clippers are trying so hard to make something work, and then Nothing ever seems to work. You know, it's the curse of the Clippers. But how about and Pat Williams? When you first brought him up, that's the thing I remember, the, all those adopted kids. Yeah. And were they like international orphans or something like well, that? Well, some were, I think, Chinese, Japanese, but I think yeah. somewhere here in America. His wife got involved in a foundation of helping raise families. He'd, He's a real was a really special gentleman. Yeah, he was. I mean, I remember seeing him interviewed just a really you know, a good soul, yep. you know, so what a shame, but, you know, remember back when Orlando had magic or had a uh, Shaquille and Penny. I mean, that was a pretty good team yep. back in the nineties. Yeah. And then he had a Dwight Howard, a young Dwight Howard. It was a really dominant Dwight Howard at that point in time. Rules changed. Franchise fell upon hard times. have never come back. I like the old, remember the little Penny commercials? Yeah. Yeah. Those were pretty cool. I enjoyed that. Lakers. I mean, I like seeing connect turn it into something. I had, I wasn't sure what to think of him. Terrific. He's turned out to be a great shooter. The whole you know, Bronny James thing is continuing to be nepotism. I don't know what to think there. Um, I am fired up for Keisha Johnson with the Heat. I think he's doing terrific. I'm worried about Ladee and the Timberwolves if he's going to really be able to stick around. His last game, he's, he finally scored nine points. He, he got part of the offense in the last T-Wolves game that they played before the Summer League shut down. I don't know if this is going to equate into a contract, whether he's going to wind up just in the G League, or maybe there's an opportunity. He went, was not much of an offensive force uh, in, in Minnesota's games. So that's the latest from the NBA. You want to talk about the Lakers, the Clippers, 
Nepo kid. That's what they started to call <laughs> Bronny James. It was a Make-A-Wish Foundation kid, right? Yeah, for the first couple of weeks, yes. <laughs> uh, a lot of derogatory stuff said about Bronny James. So jump on board, fans, for him if you want. Uh, last topic on the table here. Okay, yeah, like in the back room, we've got the high-speed sports wire, the ticker, it's rolling. Tick, 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 tick. Big horse racing story. Churchill Downs, after three years of litigation, they lifted the ban on Bob Baffert. This went on way too long. I, I thought it was condescending how they acted towards him. This all spins back to three years ago. The Derby winner, Medina Spirit, tested positive for an illegal ointment. Um, Baffert wrote a letter to Churchill Downs within the last month indicated that I take responsibility for what happened. That was my stable. That was my horse. That was my trainer. Now, he had been utterly defiant through the first two and a half years. And because Churchill Downs said, you violated this. You had a history of this. And he said this was a pure accident. It was totally defiant. So, therefore, they banned him. They banned him from the Kentucky Derby, other Horse Racing Federations, New York, California, they banned him too because they had to go uh, coinciding with the, uh, the Kentucky thing. But when the two-year ban ended, the others lifted the embargo and they took Baffert horses in New York and California and Del Mar, if you will. But Churchill kept it in for a third straight year because he was still fighting them and he had sued them and that case got thrown out of court, etc. But he finally wrote a letter and said, I take responsibility. They immediately lifted the ban so Baffert is back. All his horses will now be available to run in, in the Triple Crown races starting at Churchill Downs next spring and, and obviously have been continued to run. So that's a big item. Formula One racing. Man, is there controversy. Hungarian Grand Prix. There is huge controversy what happened on Sunday. Team McLaren finishes one and two in the race. Over the final 15 laps, they got on the head side with their top driver, Lando Norris, who has is, is, is really had a good second half of the season. And they pleaded with him to give up the lead. His teammate, Oscar Piastas, was in, first pl- was in second place. Lando was in first. And they pleaded for 15 laps. We want you to drop from one to two. Let Oscar pass you. Let him win the race. And Norris kept arguing with him. What they wanted was they wanted Lando Norris to drop to second place. He'd pick up prize money, pick up driver points. They wanted Lando to block Lewis Hamilton, who they thought was going to try to make a run to the lead. Mm. Well, Lando's got all this experience, and he successfully blocked Sir Lewis and Team Mercedes from making the pass. They were afraid if Norris won the race and Oscar dropped into second place because he was so inexperienced, and Oscar was not going to be able to hold Lewis Hamilton off. Instead, finally, with uh, more than a lap to go, Lando Norris agreed to pull over, let Oscar go by, pull back in. He blocked Lewis Hamilton. Hmm. They're fixing a race. Is that not some violation of an F1 rule? They're (laughs) fixing the race, even though McLaren finished 1-2. See, to me, it seems like they're fixing the race. And it wouldn't be a Sunday if we weren't talking about Team Red Bull and Max Verstappen. And speaking of people who are really unhappy— they are really upset at Team Red Bull. This is going to wind up in divorce court. You might even see it on your TV, <laughs> Judge Judy or whoever that is. <laughs> Verstappen spent the entire race screaming obscenities at everybody in the pit. He just wasn't running very well. The car setup wasn't good. They don't seem to have the horsepower. He's gone three straight weeks now without a win. And this is a guy who had won 16 races out of the first 18 Team Red Bull had just owned the whole F1 series. And evidently, this has just been terrible fallout last night and into today that just all the junk that was coming out of his mouth. And F1 officials hear all that because they monitor all the communications. They said it was unconscionable that this guy would conduct his business this way. We might be talking about one of the legends of F1 leaving Team Red Bull, with all of its resources and all of its success for the last three years. That's the reason Lewis Hamilton and Team Mercedes has fallen off the face of the earth, is because of Team Red Bull. And this guy is this guy's totally out of control in the cockpit, in the car, on race day. And they said the stuff he said to his pit crew, to his engineers, 
and then about ownership as he was struggling in fifth place and just never <laughs> able to get back in the race, just abominable. So divorce court, baby. Is that show run at 4.30 in the afternoon here in San Diego? Yeah, I, I think know. it might. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, John, topics on the table. You want to talk horse racing, auto racing? Go ahead. Well, you know, the, the whole bit about auto racing, it reminds me of the Tour de France, you know, where you kind of have the team block the other guys so you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're Lance Armstrong or whomever can win the thing. Um, but Verstappen's won too damn much. I like seeing new names in this thing. Going back to the Churchill Downs bit, to your point, Bob Baffert absolutely should be back in, in, in horse racing. But I just got a comment. I, I, I took the family to the Del Mar races over the weekend. Opening day was you terrific. You were the one with the, with the bad hat, right? I was yes. the one with the, bad hat, <laughs> the big wide brim hat. But uh, it was interesting. As we walked in, there were people protesting against horse racing. You know, horses have died on the track, yada, yada. And then there's other protesters there that are supporting horse racing because, you know, they're part of the industry. But we got there. It was kind of a weird vibe on opening day. There was nobody in the infield. They said it was sold out, but there were a lot of empty seats. Some of the kiosks where you could bet electronically with your voucher weren't working. So it was kind of a rocky day at Del Mar, uh, you know, but it was and it was, by the way, you were saying like it's, it was really cool there wow. because of the nice ocean breeze. Yeah, it was 94 degrees in my driveway on Saturday at <laughs> noon. I said, I'm done with this. So I, <laughs> I went to Del Mar Beach and I sat out there at a restaurant and drank and watched stuff on TV. And it was how it could be 94 in Inland North County and 71 in Marine Layer in Del Mar is beyond me. That's San Diego weather for you. Oh, microclimate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, so it, I, I enjoyed it. I was thinking about you losing all your money in that bad hat. I saw a picture of John who was bad. I, I don't quite understand. Del Mar normally opens on Thursday right after the 4th of July, but they pushed it back because the Del Mar Fair ended on um, ran long this year. And they pushed it back. So I don't understand where where the crowd was it because that, that normally draws up and out there opening day it was forty three to forty four thousand. I don't think. Of, oh, not I mean, even close. Yeah. So I was kind of kind of surprised at that. Now maybe off track betting has changed some things in terms of the turnout, but still a great place. They've done a phenomenal job. I understand about the protesters, but they have done a phenomenal job in terms of their track and the maintenance of the track. When they they went from the artificial surface back to dirt and how they maintain it, because they had one really bad summer. I think they had 18 or 21 horses died in one summer slate, and their their fatality rate is way down. It's not that way at Churchill Downs and some other places where they're still having a lot of horses go down on training that that are running on these artificial surfaces. But Del Mar is kind of become a flag carrier for safety and they've done a good job and they, they were one of the first ones that made the bold decision we're ripping up this artificial surface and we're going back to dirt or clay and this is how we're going to manicure it how we're going to treat it how we're going to water it etc so historically it's great and the breeders cup is coming back in november mm. you know and that's a signature event in horse racing that's the that that's the aftermath of all the triple crown races and they would not be coming back if they did not have great respect for everything that the Thoroughbred Club has done there at Del Mar. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a special place, Del Mar. Oh, yeah. I remember my father-in-law was saying, you know, back in the day that it was Del Mar, Santa Anita, and Hollywood Park were the three classic uh, uh, horse racing tracks in California. And I grew up in Northern California. Yeah, Golden Gate. We had Golden Gate. I, I would live kind of near Bay Meadows. Uh, but that was sort of like a minor league, if I recall. Yeah, and most of those are gone now. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, the industry is industry's gone through some really bad, challenging times. Uh, but Del Mar is a crown jewel. If you've never been to Del Mar, you know, you don't have to go on Saturday when there's a mob scene. Go go, th- go Friday or go The people Sunday. watching on opening day oh. was unbelievable. And it's not necessarily just women with these crazy hats, but it's just women and men that are dressed up for this event. And it was people watching par excellence that day. That was the highlight for me. I've never seen a guy wear a Hawaiian shirt, which has a picture of gas pumps and trucks on it. But that's what John wore, (laughs) plus the bad hat that he wore. So, hey, listen, we hope you're enjoying what we're doing. It's your turn now to take this thing over. We call this Fans Forum. I don't care where you are. You got a question, we got an answer. 
We're letting you be part of this podcast every Monday, every Thursday by going into the chat box and firing some opinions or asking some questions. This podcast is brought to you by Dixie Line Lumber and Home Centers, nine locations in San Diego to serve you. You got projects you need to deal with our best friends at Dixie Line and by North County Eye Center, offering free eye exams through the month of July. We're all going to need help with our eyes, free eye exams. Call them, set up the appointment, and just tell them Hacksaw on his podcast was raving about North County Eye Center, and rightfully so. John, these are your best friends. I don't know if they wear bad Hawaiian shirts and bad hats to Del Mar, but go ahead. Okay. Pick pick some uh, guests. Okay, let's get Callan in here to kick us off. Afternoon, gents. Hey, Lee, are you surprised by how many players in the NHL have jumped ship to play in Europe or in the KHL? This must be from the old Canada network line out of the Western Canada. Uh, Callum, I, they pay a lot of money. To me, and I've asked this question of, of NHL people and actually San Diego goal people, why would a player go play there? Just because of the uncertainty of how they treat Americans. But the hockey players are paid tremendously well to go to the KHL. The level of competition is nowhere near the National Hockey League. Um, a lot of these guys are journeyman guys. Uh, there's not a lot of stars that go to play there. Uh, our relationship with between the NHL and the KHL is really, really rocky. That's had to do a lot with politics and obviously the mess in Ukraine with Putin. But they evidently feel very safe over there. And it's a monster big league. Uh, obviously, uh, CSK Moscow, uh, Moscow Dynamo, uh, St. Petersburg, they're all some of the best franchises there. There's one in Finland that's part of that league. There's one in China that's part of that league. Um, young guys come out of there and get drafted by the NHL, uh, and then older veterans from here go back there. I'd find it really uncomfortable to live in Russia at this point in time when they're arresting Americans and all that. But the players, evidently, it must be a safe haven for them because there have been a fair number of guys that have signed with the different clubs uh, in the KHL. Well, after the whole Brittany Griner mess, sure. I mean, I, I, would, I wouldn't want to go to Russia to play. I mean, you don't know what the hell could happen. The elite leagues are in Finland, uh, in Sweden. Sw- the Swiss NHL has is, is gotten much better, and they've lured veteran players there, and they've developed some young players that have come here uh, that have played. Um, you know, there's second-tier there's second leagues in Germany. There's one in Italy. But, you know, you have to, you're on the periphery of the National Hockey League and maybe you're towards the end of your career and say, well, I'll go have the international experience and, and pay this. So there are alternatives. However, there's, there's also an import ratio. Uh, Sweden and Finland and Switzerland, you can only have three, quote, imports. Either that's Team USA members mm. or Canadians. So there's only three per team. That sounds like the quotas in the Japanese baseball league. Sure. I think you know, but there, there, you know, there's a young man here in Poway that is playing hockey in England for I think it's the Milton Keynes team, yeah. which is weird. It's an economist, but that's the name of the team, uh, and and he's had a really good run there. So I'm assuming that's like a minor league version. That's probably an A or a double A version. Yeah, but I mean, Finland, Sweden are really the elite European leagues, and Switzerland has now. Uh, really developed. The, the leading scorer of the Toronto Maple Leafs, Austin Matthews, when he had 60-plus goals this season, he left. He's from Scottsdale, Arizona. Wow. And he went and he played for the Zurich Lions as an 18-year-old. He wasn't eligible for the draft in the NHL yet. So he went there and played very, very well. He was coached by an NHL coach at that point in time. And then he had a very good season. And again, it's not it's not the grind of a season that the NHL is. I think they play maybe fifty to sixty games max mm. there. But he played, got a lot of experience, and obviously was a first round draft pick of the Maple Leafs, and has gone on to be a superstar. So, international hockey is really kind of cool, but it's it's not the National Hockey League. Okay, next question. Moving on. Okay, let's go here to Chris. 
He says, from Carlsbad to the Canadian <laughs> Rockies, show hey your lightning bolts. That home run by Otani oh. yesterday was the most mammoth shot I've ever seen in my 48 years over all the bleachers and under the roof. Now pull the bleeping trigger and acquire an ace and another outfield bat. Well, I think they're going to make a deal. Uh, even though Kershaw and Glass now have now been activated and are going to pitch, I think, Wednesday, Thursday against San Francisco. They're talking to Detroit. If I'm a Tiger fan, I think I'd be terminally pissed. Why are you trading the ace of my staff when you're trying to build this franchise? But they're talking about trading for Tarek Skubal, who's, thir- I think he's 13 and 4, 13 and 5, big strikeout guy. But evidently, they don't think they can re sign him. So, and the Otani home run. I mean, he launched that sucker into right center field, and that thing just kept going up and up, and it went, it went over the first section in the right field stands, went over the second section, and I, it hit. I think there, there's all kinds of Japanese signage boards now because mm-hmm. we talked about Otani and how the Dodgers are marketing him to corporate Japan. It, it either hit the Japanese sign above the fans in right center, or it went underneath. The, but it, if the sign had not been there, Sucker would have gone out of Dodger Stadium. I don't know if anybody's ever hit a home run at a Dodger Stadium. Otani is just crushing it. Well, didn't Tatis hit one out? I mean, it was like 467 feet a few Could years be. ago. Yeah, but I, one, I like the the in in the outfield in Dodger Stadium. They have kind of like an overhang that has like a, a VW yeah. kind of a, a look to it, like a carport or something. But imagine launching a ball over that. 473. Holy crap. I mean, I, that's... Now, I think the all-time major league record, and this goes back to when I was a kid, and I think I saw this on TV. Mickey Mantle, I think, hit a 565-foot home run in Washington at the old Griffith Stadium, went over the roof against the Washington Senators, and it was found out in the streets. And they, I don't know how you measure it, but they, they said it was 565 feet home run. Well, I think today they have the technology to get the speed and the and the launch angle yeah. and they can project the trajectory, right? And I think that's how they compute the distance. Because how can you compute, you know, the distance if it's in the second deck? It hasn't gone all the way and hit the ground on the other side. But maybe when Mantle did it, they, maybe that's how they measured it. Either that the common joke was actually a two and a half mile home run because it landed in the back seat of a taxi cab and a guy was delivering <laughs> somebody there. Okay. Thank you for the comment. Go ahead. Next question. Okay, let's talk a little golf here with Jason. He goes, I agree about Daly. His act is blah. Yeah, it is. I mean, like, I interviewed him twice, and I was just kind of turned off. And it was at that point, he was a young golfer at one Grand Slam events, and that's why he's still out there in these majors, and he's always at the bottom of the leaderboard, and he, he you know, he either disqualifies himself or he drops out. You know, he's got his sticks, he's got his smokes, he's got his suds. <laughs> but to me, he's really a bad representative of what the pro golfers of today are all about. And when his exemption runs out, you know, then he'll be playing in your golf course, miniature golf. Put, you know, just, <laughs> it's terrible. I feel I feel really bad for Tiger. This should not be happening. It's it's just a sad sad sack story to watch him limp, to watch him drag his leg. To see the scores that he's shooting, because he's nowhere near the player physical, and he can't be. He's had five different surgeries, and he could be. He's a, always been a great ambassador and an entrepreneur for the game, despite all the mess he got himself involved in uh, with his personal life. But at the end of the day, he could be a great commentator. You know, take that next step and leave the tour behind, and let us remember the greatness of the guy that won 15 Grand Slams and. 85 tournaments, not not a guy dragging his leg up the hill who is 14 over par. Well, why does he go to these events anyways? Does he just feel like he's entitled? Hey, I'm automatic qualifier. Screw you. I'm going to play. Yeah. For some reason, he holds hope that he's going to be able to find it. But he, if you can't practice a lot just because of the back and the legs, then how can you play on yeah. this tour against Xander? Well, I will say this with John Daly, when he first appeared on the scene, it was really entertaining and it was fun. But, you know, Jason's right. It's a bad act now because he went down deep into that rabbit hole of being that guy. And and now he's what's sponsored by what is it? Loudmouth, I think, with these outrageous outfits on the golf course. So he has become a cartoon character. Exactly. It violates the dress code. It just 
It just makes no sense at all. Next question. Okay, let's go here uh, down the list. Callan had another comment here I want to get in. Dodgers DFA James Paxton. Seems like a good ad for the Friars. We'll see what AJ does, I suppose. Well, Paxton's got what? He had eight or nine wins, and he's played pretty well. Now, maybe he's DFA'd because he's hurt. He's, he's got a history of a lot of injuries. So I'd, I'll be intrigued to see that maybe he winds up on the disabled list. But he's he's been hurt a lot, but yet he competes, he scraps. And like I say, I think he's either got eight or he, last night he pitched against the Red Sox and hung in there for a while. But maybe he winds up on somebody's disabled list. Yeah, he's always been kind of a broken down guy. You yeah, know? Seattle, Boston. And yet there were flashes. He pitched pretty well. He was At one point he was 5-0 and out of the gate with the Dodgers, but he was giving up walks and he was you know, had men on base all the time. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Paxton, I, I, I'm surprised that the Dodgers signed him in the, in the first place. Let's go back down here. Derek had a comment about the Bears. He goes, the Bears better hope Williams is as diligent with the playbook <laughs> as he is with figuring out his contract. Yeah, the entrepreneur. I was kind of stunned. And, you know, I kept getting bits and fragments of what what these lawyers were proposing. And I said, this isn't right. You know, no, nobody's ever done this before. Of course, now we talk about Otani and the deferred payments, etc. But... Um, in the NFL came back and said, no, you can't change the collective bargaining agreement. This is the language. You can have incentive bonuses and your contractors four years with a fifth year option. We're not putting in loans and we're not putting in all this other creative financing. Um, he's a good player. And I'll tell you, Chicago, they, they I think, and we're going to talk about the NFL a, a lot more now that camps are rolling. Um, Chicago did a lot to add talent around him. I mean, they, they, you know, they got Keenan Allen. That's a big time route runner. And they've got a really good tight end. They're three deep at running back. And then they drafted Odunzie from the University of Washington. So the Bears offensively are going to be what the Bears haven't been offensively ever since I can ever remember. You know, yeah, they were a Super Bowl team, but that was the monster of the Midway's defense. Mike Singletary and Mike Ditka and, and all that. This, this is going to be a dynamic offensive team. And I think Williams is a hell of a student of the game and I you know they're going to build an offense with guys who can run and sprint draw running backs and then Williams may run the ball some too so it's going to be fascinating to see what happens in Chicago well back in the 80s they had sweetness right you know they, they, you know they had Peyton there Jim McMahon I mean that do- offense was all right I mean it wasn't you know it was Walter Peyton oh yeah okay it was Peyton he was fantastic but the cut the, the the Bears have not been anything since 1985 right I, I, I don't think the Bears have the Bears ever had a 3,000-yard passing quarterback? I don't think so. Oh, I doubt it. No. I mean, as a young kid growing up, their quarterback was Billy Wade, and then their quarterback was a left-handed Bobby Douglas. Good luck with pass completions and that. <laughs> you know, and then obviously McMahon was a dynamic fire bo- firebrand leader, but it was still Walter Payton's offense, you know, sandwiched and wrapped around a just a phenomenally great, might have been the be- greatest Super Bowl defense of all time, the Fridge and and Singletary and, and Dave Durson and, and all those guys. Chicago's just never had any quarterbacks. So now now they got a quarterback. I, it bears watching. I think, I think they're going to be a fun team to follow. The Bears bear watching. The Bears. <laughs> okay. Next topic. Okay, let's go to David. Talk a little Olympics. He says, hey, are you going to be covering the Paris Olympics? John Hacksaw, what's your favorite Olympic sport to watch? Uh, I'm a big track and field guy, I, especially the Summer Olympics. I just love to see the American sprinters. And we've got some great female speed queens, and we got great sprinters. I love the relay teams. So I, I like track and field. Uh, when they had the Olympics here in 84 in L.A., I wasn't working in Phoenix at that time. I came over, and I, I got to see the Brazilian volleyball team. Unbelievable. And I had not really been exposed to much volleyball. I was really impressed. And I got to see some great track and field events at the L.A. Coliseum and, and all that. It's, just, it's so much fun to watch. A time difference is going to make it kind of hard in Paris because a lot of these events will have already been run. So you're not going to see everything live that you'd like to see. But I like that. I, I'm a huge winter guy. And, of course, I'm a, I came from snow country. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'd, I'd, I'd love to see uh, the bobsleds. And obviously, I'd love to see the ski jumps. So, I mean, those guys, you talk about courageous coming off the slopes. Wow. So I like I like the Olympics. I don't like the money in the Olympics. I don't like the politics of the Olympics. And that won't go away. 
And when they brought the when the professionals became part of the Olympics, I think it took a little bit of the luster off it. But at the end of the day, the then Soviet Union, those all were army military members were playing on the Olympic hockey team. Hmm. That's why 1980 and Herb Brooks and Jim Craig, the goalie, and Mike Ruzioni, that's why that was such a great moment in Olympic history because our college kids beat Tretiak and all the Russian professionals. So, And unfortunately, the Olympics now have been stained by an awful lot of cheating, uh, blood doping, uh, whether it's swimmers, whether it's track and field people. You know, China, Russia, it's a huge issue. And it's also the great debate because of what Russia has done to Ukraine. Do we take it out on the Russian athletes and ban them? They're not going to wear Russian uniforms. They're going to be an independent federation mm. running by themselves. It's not going to be, quote, that team. So you like the Olympics. What do you like most? Oh, I, I love them. I, I just think it's funny. Hacksaw going out, checking out the Brazilian beach volleyball team. Mm. Um, you know, the sprints are always fantastic. Um, I When I was a kid, I raced BMX, and that was a big thing, bicycle motocross. And now it's an Olympic sport. I think this is its second year. So for me, that's a personal thrill to see that, especially in skateboarding, too. But you know, one thing that I seems like there's so much swimming, you know, it's the freestyle, the breaststroke. I mean, every possible configuration of swimming, I kind of get bored with it. But I don't have a problem with the pros playing. I mean, what's your take on Team USA? They almost lost to South Sudan. Well, South Sudan has a couple of NBA players there, and they caught them on a bad night. And I don't think Steve Kerr and those guys walked in there with the focus that we got a big game here. And, you know, that that was their that was their Olympic matchup for the South Sudanese, but they do have athletes and they, they've got some NBA guys who are kind of part of that whole mix. Mm -hmm. So I was a little surprised, but I don't know, to have the pros, I, you you know, playing the NBA championship and raising the trophy is what it's all about. And you're all making mega money. How important is it to get a gold medal? Cool playing for the flag. But, you know, if you're dominating everybody, although they didn't dominate, you know, and they got screwed by the Russians way back in the day. Uh, the David Thompson era. So I, 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 I like an awful lot of the Olympic competition, and we never get to see it. I, I had hoped that U.S. track and field, because of the success we've had with our sprinters, would take off as an entity in the non-Olympic years. And yet the, the outside of the events in Eugene, Oregon, which is a fabulous facility at the University of Oregon, Track and field just seems to be stagnated. It's just not grown, and maybe there's not enough money in there for the to lure all the great athletes. But we should be better across the board and everything in track and field than we are. Yeah, and you know the the women sprinters are are fantastic. Oh yeah, and I, and just the way they look and they're styled and, and 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 all of the the electricity around it, I think is fantastic. Um, Usain Bolt, when did he retire? I mean, it's been out of the Olympics for a few times. Well, yeah, eight years ago, maybe. Yeah, and, and I think but Jamaica is probably going to still have some good oh, sprinters. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. It was a big story. I think it was in the New York Times about all of our American distance runners training Flagstaff now to train in the high altitude. Hey, that makes sense. You know, and, and those guys, you know, the, the great distance runners globally, they train in South Africa because of distances, because of altitude, et cetera. The Kenyans, I mean, a phenomenal number of great, great runners. And they all train at altitude, and then America has just kind of caught up to it. This is what we should be doing. What's that race, the steeplechase, where they have to, like, jump over water? Or? Yeah, hurdles and water, and yeah, exactly. That's kind of a funky one. Different. <laughs> all right, yeah, the Olympics, I think the opening ceremonies are Thursday in Paris, so that'll be an interesting couple of weeks run. Right on. Move on. Move on. Let's go to social media here. we got a bunch of guys that want to get involved. And, uh, hey, let's talk about the Guardians. And this is from Phil. He says, hey, the Guardians are good. People forget that they were the youngest team in the league two years ago and forced the Yanks to a, play a full five in the playoffs. Last year was their sophomore slump season, but they came back this year ready to rock. Good for them. Yeah, great young pitching. Uh, Lot of, not, not a lot of household names, but young, big arms. And they're doing all this without um, Shane Bieber, Bieber. Oh, yeah, Bieber, yeah. Yeah, he's been on the disabled list all year with season-ending elbow surgery. Uh, they don't. They, they really need another bat. I mean, they, they've, they've got uh, Jose Ramirez, who I think is one of the most underrated players in baseball, and they got the ex-Padre Josh Naylor, and they got his brother Bo Naylor, that's the extent of it. They don't hit a lot of home runs, and they play a lot of 2-1, 1-0, 3-1 games. 
maybe they're going to make a deal. What what they need is just a veteran rental bat. They need a Justin Turner. They need a J.D. Martinez because mm-hmm. you put another potential power bat in the middle of that batting order. But they're drawn really well. Um, I've been kind of critical of Cleveland ownership for a long time. Again, I worked in Cleveland. I grew up as an Indians fan. I was a Long Island kid that hated the Yankees, the Dodgers, and the Giants for some reason. I like Chief Wahoo, the logo. So I grew up as an Indians fan, the Rocky Colavitos and the Herb Scores of the world. Um, but their ownership has, has turned what I think is a potential great regional franchise into a small franchise because they, they don't have a big payroll. I went crazy Friday night. I don't. I know you were getting dressed to go to the track on Saturday. You didn't see my six thirty sports package on KUSI. Mm. I did a commentary on the Padres losing to Cleveland. I went crazy Friday night because the Padres gave up six runs in the eighth inning. The hundred sixty one million dollar Padre payroll lost to a Cleveland team. You know what their payroll was Friday night at first pitch? Fifty seven million. Really? Yeah. They lost to a 57 million team. Now, Cleveland organizationally is great. A lot of young players, really a bunch of stud young pitchers, and they've fought through a lot of injuries along the way just to stay with it. But you lost to a 57 million team. I was just beyond my mind. Hmm. Remember the 90s? They were really good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Didn't they make the World Series one of those years? They might have. My car grove. Okay. Yeah. And, and just think of all the great Indians in the past. I mean, you were just mentioning some of them, but they were in the. They were the team, and I think in the '54 World Series, they got the, beat by the, the Giants and Willie Mays. Exactly, and they won their their last championship. I think was '48. Bill Veck on the team, mm. uh, Boston Braves. But so it's been few and far between. But they've they've always had good players. I I think it has a potential to be a phenomenal regional franchise. Oh, yeah. But because of low budgets, they turned it into a Cleveland franchise. Did you like the movie Major Leagues? It was funny. Yeah, it was it was kind of. Weird, but that's okay. It's just, I mean, it, it it was Hollywood creative stuff at its best. Yeah, I know. I so. think it's a great movie. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on here. Let's uh, let's let's talk about some Dodgers here. And this is from Rosecrans Robbie. He says we deal Outman and Lux for value right now. A good reliever, a better injury staff, a washing machine. At this point, just release them and lower parking fees. Well, they're not going to lower parking fees. I'll grant you that, but. They they do have resources to make a deal. They got two more pitchers at AAA that one one could be shopped. Um, they've obviously got Outman, um, who is hitting pretty good at Oklahoma City. Lux had a horrible start. Now Lux is starting to hit. And he's a multi position guy, second and short. If if they're the ones that win the bidding war for Scooble of Detroit, they're going to have to put some of those names that we just mentioned into that package. But I will also tell you the Yankees are talking to Detroit, and the Yankees have finally decided they're going to trade Spencer Jones, big power hitter. He's from San Diego. Yeah, Carlsbad. Yeah. They're willing to put him in the package if they can get Scooble. Yankees pitching is terrible right now. I think the Yankees are, I want to say, 6-16 and in their last 22. And I think the stat I read this morning, the Yankees starting staff in that 22-game window, starting staff has an ERA of 5.20. And have had injuries. And, I mean, Garrett, Garrett Cole's come back, but he's not the dominant Garrett Cole yet. So the Dodgers are talking to us about Scooble. Now the Yankees have jumped into the bidding. Baltimore wants another veteran frontline guy. They're talking to Detroit. All of a sudden, Scooble becomes the top pitcher on the trade block, superseding Evaldi uh, from Texas and, and obviously Quantrill, uh, Eflin down in Tampa. So... One domino is going to fall pretty quickly, and then we'll have to see who scrambles to go get the other pitchers. You know, the Padres are trying hard, but the Padres don't have the amount of resources that the Yankees have or obviously the the depth of wealth in the system the Dodgers have. I have always loved this time of the year. Oh, trade you deadline? Know, the, the trade deadline stuff in Major League Baseball is fantastic. And some teams, they can really jockey and put themselves in a great position. But what happened to Altman and Lux? I mean, Altman still has a future, but is Lux washed up since well, that Lux injury? Well, Lux had a major knee injury. And he missed yeah. more than a year. And he just hasn't come back and been the same player. But he was a hitting machine. When he marched through the Dodgers system, he got there. Now, maybe he's out of position. Maybe he's more second baseman than he is shortstop. And, of course, they they moved Mookie Betts to shortstop. And now he's had this, this catastrophic injury with a fractured hand. And they don't know whether he's going to be back in September yet. So... But 
Guys get hurt, and sometimes it takes them a long time to come back. I mean, the fact that Lux has hit everywhere he's always played leads me to believe he'll hit again. He's starting to hit better after that point where he's hitting 111, you know, first couple months of the Dodgers season. That was a brutal knee injury, by the way. That was oh, like yeah. two spring trainings ago, and I think. It was a fluke. It was against the Padres. Yeah. Just spikes caught. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I saw it. I yeah, saw it was in between second and third, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, running the bases. Okay, let's we move, move on. on. Let's go Chargers here uh, from Matt. He says, hey, Lee, we have a top five quarterback, a top five O-line, and a top five pass rush group. Just watch. Awful optimistic. It's awful early, Matt. You have a top five quarterback. I do agree. Top five offensive line has to prove itself yet. We don't know that yet. Now, they do have three number one draft picks in that O front. Holes at running back. Help wanted wide receiver. Now, granted, you've got the coach, and he's changing the culture. And we'll just have to see whether all the new parts they brought in. They got rid of 11 starters in the offseason. They do have, there's no doubt they have edge rushers. I mean, they're four deep at edge rushers, and they, they brought Perriman back in. They drafted the kid uh, from Michigan. But they have no experience or no success at defensive tackle. They cut all their tackles. So who's going to be a tough guy up inside? And I still think there's holes in the secondary that they got to address because they, they ran off a whole bunch of guys in the secondary. So it's work in progress. I would think, Matt, a year from this afternoon, we're doing this podcast, unless John gets deported or arrested. <laughs> a year from this afternoon, they're going to be a, a much better team. But they've, they've got to go through this this massive shift, seismic shift. Coordinators, playbook, culture. That does not happen overnight real quick. And they got so many holes. I mean, if you were telling me Harbaugh, Justin Herbert, Austin Eckler, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, I'd say, damn right, AFC championship possible team. Those guys are all gone, and they still have to prove the toughness on defense. So that's one man's opinion, but usually my one man's opinion's right on. And John Riley says, "Well, what about Gus Edwards? Because he's injury prone, right? I mean, uh, heavy duty coming off an off knee surgery. J.K. Dobbins, very vibrant guy, kind of like Eckler. He's coming off an Achilles and." He was out on the open market for a long time. The only reason he got a job here is because the general manager, Joe Hickson, came from Baltimore. Oh, the Baltimore. Yeah, yeah. There you go. But but if Edwards gets hurt again, I mean, they don't really have a power running guy, do they? Not a power guy to be in the power mode that Harbaugh wants to run the bloody football all mm-hmm. the time. Um, I mean, they do have Isaiah Spiller, who's a third-year guy. You see little flashes, but he's never been given much of an opportunity. If somebody gets hurt, he's going to get that opportunity. But the, to me, there's just there's too many unanswered questions with the opening of the, of the Charger camp. Veterans show up on Tuesday night. First practice is on Wednesday. So we'll be talking a lot more NFL as, as we march through the next couple of weeks. So, you know, my private hope is that Justin Herbert will go 17-0 and one of these years and that Gene Spanos will go 0-17, <laughs> but that's that the way I again. feel. Yes. <laughs> That doesn't make any sense. We have all these new viewers that have never heard that okay. sales pitch. All right. All right. Let's 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 squeeze in one more here. Got an Aztec comment, and this is from King Zoa. He goes, that's disrespectful at, you know, the number eight prediction in the Mountain West. But I don't trust any of the quarterbacks personally. If they could stay big in the trenches and keep their ground game explosive, they have a chance to be in the top five. Clean piece of paper at San Diego State. New coach. I understand the media not knowing who Sean Lewis is. I know what that guy accomplished, what he did at Colorado before the injury set in, what he did for two years at Kent State, which is like being on the moon, and for him to flip that thing with as many skilled people as he did. And prior to that, what he did at Bowling Green, what he did at Syracuse with quarterbacks and receivers, this is going to be fun to watch. So I'm a Sean Lewis backer. But a lot of new pieces. I mean, I'm trying to think. My numbers are so... So confusing right now. I want to I want to say they wound up with 34 transfers coming in the door. They wound up losing. There's 42 who transferred out. They got an awful lot of transfers on the offense, and that takes time. This offense is really different. It's going to be Aztec fast. I call it Air Aztec. They're they're going to run snaps every eight seconds. They're going to throw the ball. They're going to run sprint draws out of it. But there's so many new components there. It's just it's going to take time to see. I mean, and the whole offensive line's been rebuilt with guys from other places. 
They have more transfers on offense than they do on defense. They do have younger guys on defense that are going to start with a, a bunch of big body transfers. So work in progress, but I believe in that guy's playbook, and I, I nobody else seems to have paid very much attention. All you need to do is Google Sean Lewis, Kent State, and watch what he did formation wise and how many plays there. And over six thousand yards in offense. John, you know how much how many snaps that is to get over sixty six hundred all purpose yards running and receiving in what, a twelve game schedule at Kent State and he did it back to back seasons with different quarterbacks. Wow. I mean that's like having all five hundred yard games, you yeah. know, all season long. You know, I'm intrigued by Sean Lewis. I'm curious. I'm hopeful for the Aztecs. But the Mountain West, I think I read somewhere there's eight new head coaches, eight new starting quarterbacks, so it could be a wide open field. Yeah, wide open. Uh, they they have a really colorful schedule. I mean, they're playing some big time teams here, and they get Oregon State and Washington State come here as part of this Pac two alignment where the Cougars and the Beavers are going to play everybody in the conference. That's how they fill their schedule when the Pac twelve fell apart. So, I mean, they're going to get Oregon State, Washington State here, which I think will be fun games to watch. But I I, I think it's a this is a really bright light coach. So you can go on the message boards, tell them Hacksaw believes San Diego State's going to be really good in football. <laughs> All right. Listen, hope you have enjoyed what we brought your way. We're here Mondays at 1 p.m. with bonus coverage, Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific with our regular coverage. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for participating. This podcast brought to you by Dixie Line Lumber and Home Centers, nine stores to serve you, and North County Eye Center with free eye exams. Call them. Call them. And tell them Hacksaw sent me in to set up an appointment. John, you're not going to wear that hat. You ought to wear that hat and that freaking Hawaiian shirt on here on Thursday so everybody could see what the hell you wore and embarrassed yourself. No, I mean, at least I didn't have like those. You see the hat the women's wear at Del Mar? Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. With the fruit and the vegetables and the Carmen Miranda style? Oh, yeah. Some of them are enormous hats. I don't know how in the hell they walk around. I don't know. Yours was pretty much off the charts, too. <laughs> have yourself a great day. We'll see you come Thursday. Right on, Lee. Looking forward to it. And thanks for being with us. Love having you here. Hope you're enjoying our weekly podcast, Hacksaw's Headlines. Join us again for Hacksaw's Headlines on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And find the audio version on your favorite podcast app. Touchdown, San Diego! For more content, go to LeeHacksawHamilton.com.